Well, seven, two. Okay. Uh, so let's start. Okay, Jeffrey. I'm going okay. to introduce you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, Jeffrey. Directly from San Francisco. No, not San Francisco. Lake Tahoe. Yeah. <laughs> good night to the Brazilian who are watching us. Today we prepare a webinar with Dr. Jeffrey Yao. He is a teacher director of Hand and Upper Extremity Surgery Fellowship, Robert Chase Hand and Upper Limb Center, Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Stanford University Medical Center in California. We divided this webinar in two parts. The first presentation, Dr. Jeffrey, about the arthroscopic approach of scaphalonate injury. At the second one, we are going to present three cases. I had the opportunity to contact Dr. Dr. Jeffrey uh, twice in Brazil. The first in event of uh, Brazilian society, the regional Brazilian society in Sao Paulo about five years ago. And the second one, two years ago, when he made our Brazilian Congress in Fortaleza shine. His great experience in, in wrist arthroscopy placed him in great prom prominence as one of the world reference in this the subject in this subject a special thanks for accepting our invitation even though you are on vacation with your family uh, i ask the people that uh, is watching uh, seeing the this webinar that is send your questions in the chat so, so we are going to choose the questions to to send to dr jeffrey uh, when we start the discussion. So, Jeffrey, please, could you, I'm going to leave, uh, to stop sharing, and please share your presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to move these. Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for, for being uh, a part of this. Uh, it's a very big honor and pleasure for me to participate. I want to thank Marcelo for inviting me uh, to participate in this webinar. Uh, I always enjoy any opportunity to speak about the scaphalunate ligament. Um, and I also really enjoy uh, speaking to my friends uh, from Brazil. Uh, I've had many uh, nice encounters and, and visits to Brazil, as Marcelo pointed out. Uh, including this visit, um, or including this time in Fortaleza two years ago at the Brazilian Society uh, meeting, which was a, a wonderful event uh, chaired by uh, Marcelo. So uh, I really enjoy our friendships, and I enjoy speaking with all of you and our, our not only our social uh, um, relationships, but also our professional and educational relationships as well. Uh, this is where I'm from, again, Stanford University. This is my email address. Should any questions arise, uh, happy to speak to you or answer any questions during this webinar or also uh, via the uh, internet if you would like. Um, also, we often have uh, visitors and we've had uh, a couple of visitors from Brazil um, come to visit us at Stanford as uh, clinical scholars and came to visit us to observe. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to contact me as well. Okay, so I'll skip all the basic uh, things about the scaphalunate ligament. I think we're all familiar with that. So um, I'll go right towards our pathologic conditions. Uh, this is widely accepted, uh, the, the categories of pathologic conditions that we see with scaphalunate ligament injuries. And I'll go through basically the first uh, two or three I won't really focus on the slack wrist. That's a different discussion altogether. And primarily, arthroscopy is not very, um, uh, can be used uh, for the slack wrist. There have a, a PRC and uh, scapegoat excision four corner fusion has been described uh, via arthroscopic technique, uh, but I won't focus on this uh, during this discussion. So I'd like to share with you my thoughts on the treatment of the pre dynamic or and dynamic instability patterns. Initially, the, the, activity, uh, the treatment is with activity modification for our, our patients in California. We have a lot of patients who like to do yoga, push-ups, weightlifting, et cetera. 
And uh, the avoidance of the risk hyperextension and actual loading often can help, uh, as well as the mobilization for low-grade scapholunate ligament injuries. Corticosteroid injections can help with some synovitis and the dorsal wrist impingement-like syndromes. But ultimately, if this all fails, uh, then we talk about uh, surgery. And, it, and I think this is the best indication for arthroscopy when, re when discussing the scapholunate ligament um, before the ligament's completely disrupted. So here we have, uh, uh, for, uh, to demonstrate this, a 22-year-old football player. Uh, this would be American football uh, with dorsal central wrist pain. The radiographs are not particularly um, telling. However, on MRI, you can see the dorsal scapulinate ligament has been uh, ruptured or at least partially ruptured. Uh, and on arthroscopy, you can see uh, this is a mid carp arthroscopy. And so we could see the scaphoids on the left and the lunate is on the right. I have an instrument through the ulnar midcarpal portal uh, demonstrating the dissociation between the scaphoid and lunate viewed via the radial midcarpal portal directly down onto the scapholunate interval. And what you can see in the background, um, hopefully you can see my pointer, this is the volar scapholunate ligament here. In fact, here we can actually see the radial scapocapitate ligament running through here. Um, Marcel, I don't know if you're, you have audio, but can you, can you see my pointer? Yes, we are yes, seeing. Yes, that's okay. yes. Great. Yeah, great. I see it. Great. So this yeah. is the yeah, really great. So this is the radio scapocapitate ligament going from the radial stylite across the waist of the scaphoid and to attach to the capitate. Uh, and this is the volar radio. Um, sorry, volar scapholunate ligament, scaphoid here, lunate here, and here's the gap. So. Uh, I'm fond of the Geisler classification of these tears. Uh, it's what I trained on and what I use routinely. There is an EWAS classification as well, uh, but suffice it to say, this is grad graded based on the level of instability with a higher level of instability indicating a higher grade. And so this, in this situation, uh, in this patient's um, uh, mid-carp arthroscopy, this would can be considered Geisler grade three injury. And this is the EWAS classification, also uh, serendipitously a grade three uh, stage of uh, ligament injury. So when it comes to the treatment of these injuries, I'm very fond of debridement of the loose, um, unstable ligament, uh, as well as thermal shrinkage. And I'll get to more of the thermal shrinkage in a moment. Now, we also add pinning if there's a higher grade level of instability, particularly a Geisler grade three. So I want to emphasize that this is the pathology we're talking about. The ligament is, if it were this rubber band, is just being stretched. It's not completely ruptured. So as such, there's still some ligament substance um, to, to, um, to heal itself. So it's, it's kind of delaminated and stretched out rather than actually ruptured. And so shrinkage it has been... Um, somewhat villainized, uh, vilified in the orthopedic literature, particularly in the shoulder literature, mostly because it's failed, uh, thermal shrinkage has failed in the shoulder. And um, the reason for that I'll discuss in a moment. And the wrist, however, I think has, it has a very good uh, indication. So here would be the ligament, there's the volar ligament uh, there being uh, shown uh, before and after the thermal treatment. And the way this works is it restores stability by thermally shrinking um, the collagen. Uh, we believe this also leads to some secondary fibroplasia and scarring. We also believe that there's a denervation effect, and I'll get to that more in a moment as well. The results are poor in the shoulder, but excellent in the wrist. The way this works, um, and this is again from the sports medicine literature, is that type one collagen is, is really made up of collagen fibrils uh, organized in a triple helix linked by two types of covalent bonds. We have heat label bonds and heat stable bonds. The heat label bonds are the bonds that are they're broken with the thermal treatment and the heat stable bonds remain intact. So when the heating disrupts the heat label bonds, the fact that the heat stable bonds are still intact, there's a net shrinkage. And I tell people that it's sort of like taking a piece of meat and putting it on a, on a, on a grill or something and it shrinks. Um, um, and so the um, and the residual tension causes that, that to shrink and the, the heat label bonds will then 
reform themselves over the course of six weeks. And this is why it failed in the shoulder because in the shoulder, you can't immobilize a patient for six weeks Otherwise, their shoulder will never move again. So because the mo you need that six weeks for that collagen to mature, and, th and that's how it works in the, in, the, in the wrist because we can actually cast the patient for six weeks and allow that collagen to mature and then start therapy thereafter. So this is what it would look like before. And then in this case, we pin the joint. You could see arthroscopic assisted. We reduce the scaphoid and lunate interval and we place k percutaneously to hold the interval uh, and then for, perform the shrinkage. We also believe there's a denervation effect uh, by the, the thermal treatment. Um, we did this and showed this in our laboratory where we added the thermal treatment to the ligament and then stained the ligament for neuronal markers. And we found that there was a paucity of neuronal markers in the area where the ligament was treated. Clinical results, there's many different results out there. Most of them short-term, two years, uh, roughly two years. This is a study we published with longer follow-up, seven-year follow-up, Geisler stages one through three, all treated with thermal shrinkage, and we see the outcomes are quite good. And most importantly, none of these patients required any subsequent surgery. So I do believe that this is a very effective treatment modality for the lower grade ligament injuries where the ligament's not completely ruptured. Obviously, if it's completely ruptured, then there's, there's nothing to shrink back together. Uh, but when it's partially ruptured, this is a very effective treatment. And this is that patient, 22 year old, five months after surgery with near full range of motion. Um, so again, my algorithm for these um, injuries, and this quite frankly is one of, my, one of the most common patients that I see in my practice. Patients, they don't have a complete ligament injury but they have dorsal wrist pain, particularly with hyperextension, doing a push-up or, or yoga. Uh, I usually try to immobilize them for four weeks, modify their activity, inject some steroids, and if that all fails and the MRIs consist with a partial ligament injury, uh, then I do think that wrist arthroscopy has excellent uh, indication uh, with the thermal shrinkage plus or minus pinning, and we've shown that in our clinical studies. What about moving on to static instability? Um, this requires more than a complete, more than a partial rupture, but a complete rupture of the scapulinar ligament, as well as potentially the uh, secondary stabilizers. Uh, here's a 40-year-old patient fell from a bike. Now here on the x-ray, we can clearly see, this is not a grip view, but you can clearly see on a standard static AP, uh, sorry, PA radiograph, you can see the gapping between the scaphoid and lunate. And again, don't necessarily need an MRI in this situation, but there you could see the gap uh, on MRI. With the wrist arthroscopy, you could see there's a complete widened interval between the scaphoid and lunate. This is what we call the drive-through sign, and where we can drive through with the scope between the scaphoid and lunate and visualize the capitate, which is right in the center of the screen right here, um, um, as the scope is visualizing, visualizing through from the radial, uh, from the, um, uh, radial carpal joint. Once you have a complete scaphalunate ligament injury with a gap, this is a, uh, from the EWAS classification uh, stage four, as well as the Geisler classification to stage four as well. In this case, most of the time, uh, we'll treat these with an open suture anchor repair. Um, and this is uh, what you can see here. We usually uh, insert a suture anchor in the scaphoid or lunate, wherever it's uh, ruptured from, insert some k wires between the scaphoid and lunate to stabilize that interval, a scaphoid capitate pin, for additional stability to help prevent scaphoid flexion uh, and repair the ligament. However, uh, a few years ago, we, we published a technique of arthroscopic repair of a complete scaphalunate interosseous ligament. Uh, first, we wanted to show anatomic feasibility. So we wanted to see and show that we could definitively see the dorsal scaphalunate ligament uh, from the radial carpal joint using standard arthroscopy portals. So we looked at uh, 10 fresh frozen cadavers. Uh, we uh, used this arthroscopy tower in neutral position, normal gentle traction. We used a standard arthroscope. We used the standard 4-5 portal. And we and made an attempt to visualize as dorsally as possible the dorsal scaphalunate ligament. Uh, we inserted a K-wire from uh, the standard 3-4 portal into the scaphoid adjacent to the most dorsal portion of the ligament visualized. We didn't do any extra maneuvers, didn't have to flex the wrist or anything. So basically we're visualizing the ligament, putting a K-wire through under arthroscopic visualization, 
And then what we did is we dissected the uh, cadaver to see where that K wire was relative to the dorsal scaphalunate ligament, the most important structural portion of the ligament, which had ruptured, to basically see if we can actually get to the footprint from where these ligaments typically, um, typically uh, evolve. And here you can see a cadaveric specimen. You can see the K wire has been placed here. This is the dorsal ridge uh, from which the scaphalunate ligament usually uh, attaches. And you can see, clearly we can see far enough dorsally to identify the, um, the footprint of the scaphalunate ligament. Uh, we also identified this prominence from which the scaphalunate ligament typically um, attaches. Um, so uh, again, this shows that we were clearly uh, had plenty of space. So what this basically want, showed us is that we had enough space to actually perform a procedure. We could see where the ligament was ruptured from using standard portals, and then we could actually do the procedure. Um, and so uh, that's basically what we concluded, that we could actually see these structures. And so the technique of the repair, this video plays, here we go. Here's the standard four or five viewing portal. And then the three, four portal, this is where we would be passing our suture and inserting our anchor. Now this would be using its knotless anchor and we use an accessory one, two portal for shoveling the suture. So what I'm demonstrating here is the scaphalunate ligament, the scaphoids in the background, I'm using a knife to basically cut the ligament iatrogenically. Uh, this is an open specimen to just show what we're doing. And then this is a suture passer. We pass the suture via the three, four portal through the substance of the scaphalunate ligament and this is the uh, instrument being demonstrated here. There's this scaphalunate ligament there. And passing it through the, the, the substance of the scaphalunate ligament. And then harvest it after it's, um, after it's passed through the suture passer. Once we harvest that, then we pull it out through the 1-2 portal, accessory portal. And then... Um, retrieve it back through the 3-4 three, four, three, four portal. As you can see here, we're grabbing it through the 3-4 portal. Now we have both limbs through the 3-4 portal. We insert a slotted camera cannula through the 3-4 portal, put this on that spot on the dorsal lunate, sorry, dorsal scaphoid from which the uh, ligament's been ruptured. And now we're loading the uh, knotless anchor with the suture. And you can see the suture has the bite in the um, ligament. We drill through that cannula, our pilot hole for the anchor, into the scaphoid. There you can see the drill going. And you see the two limbs of the uh, suture are passed through this knotless anchor. Again, these are just open images just to show you what we're doing arthroscopically because it doesn't always make sense what you're looking at arthroscopically. Now it's being inserted into the um, scaphoid. And because it's knotless, all you have to do is impact the anchor into the scaphoid. And that completes your repair. And you can, once you get down to the laser line there, then you know you're deep enough. You could see the suture through the scapulinate ligament. You could see the amount of tension that's on the ligament. And then the, uh, you could see the final repair there. And that's what it would look like when it was completed. So um, we immobilize our patients for, uh, with 262C wires for about eight weeks, and then we start therapy. What we found is this is definitely feasible, but it is technically, technically demanding. So this was published uh, several years ago, but it hasn't really gotten uh, that much popularity because it is uh, technically challenging. And most people, especially even uh, your more skilled arthroscopists feel more comfortable just opening these and fixing them via an open approach. But it is a possible using an arthroscopic technique if you, if you prefer. Um, what about the chronic scaphalunate ligament injuries where it's static, you have a DZ, um, and there's no arthritis? Uh, the Garcia Elias classification would be grade three or four. It's reducible, uh, but there's no, um, and there's no arthritis, but there's no ligament to repair. Again, the EWAS classification, class four. In this situation, there's many different options, capsule DCs, ligament reconstructions, uh, many uh, bone ligament bone um, uh, autograph procedures, 
Razzle procedures, there's uh, many different options. And then there's also the salvage procedures, which I initially discussed, uh, PRC or partial risk fusion. Capsule adhesive procedures, most of these are obviously being, being done open um, with, with decent results. However, uh, Christoph Matulin has shown a arthroscopic method of treating these uh, with an arthroscopic capsule adhesis. And basically, he's, uh, his, the entire theory is based upon the fact that, again, the prominent, prominent role for scaphalunate stability is not only the dorsal scaphalunate ligament, but the dorsal radiocarpal ligament and the dorsal intercarpal ligament, as well as what he calls the dorsal capsule scaphalunate septum or DCSS, uh, which will also provides stability. So the thought is that you can, if you capsule these all those structures together, uh, that can help stabilize the scaphalunate interval. And also more importantly, as we've learned that uh, the primary pathology with scaphalunate dissociation is dorsal subluxation of the proximal pole of the scaphoid. And so what these dorsal capsule adhesive procedures do is it keeps the scaphoid uh, buttressed from, from escaping dorsally. Uh, and that's why they work even though radiographically sometimes you see the gap between the scaphoid and the lunate persists. Uh, but as long as the scaphoid is maintained in the scaphoid facet and does not abnormally wear on the scaphoid facet, you prevent those sequelae of the slack wrist. And so this is the procedure that, um, that Christoph uh, uh, published upon, which is very, uh, very uh, elegant procedure. At first glance, it looks somewhat uh, unbelievable, but I'll tell you that now after doing uh, several of these in my own patients, I'm, I'm very, um, um, I'm a believer of this technique. It's surprisingly powerful. So here's one where the ligament's completely disrupted and you can see Needles are placed through both limbs of the ligament, and then a knot is, is tied between the two sutures. The knot then is uh, placed both on either side of the capsule. You can see in this lower figure here, and that's your capsule adhesis. So here's one of my patients, Geisler grade three, um, a little bit greater of a dissociation than the one I showed earlier, which I treated with thermal shrinkage. So you can see the gap between the scaphoid and lunate. Um, and so I'm placing the needles through uh, the ligament. So again, the scope is in the 4-5 portal. Uh, the needles are going through piercing the ligament through the 3-4 portal. Um, and then we harvest the needle. Now we're in the mid-carpal joint where we see both needles through the ligament. And we pass the suture um, on, uh, outside the joint, tie a knot, pass the knots back through and you can see the knot in the lower right-hand corner stabilizing from the intra-articular portion. Then you'll have your two knots on the other side. Actually, this is gonna show as I pull the, the knot into the joint, that's securing our dorsal scaphalunia interval down to the um, dorsal capsule. You can see the knot there. And let's see, it should advance shortly. Now you can see as I pull on the sutures, that gap closes. I'm not, I haven't tied the knot yet, but as I pull on the suture, the gap between the scaphoid and lunate closes. So it's surprisingly effective. There it's open again. And then in a moment, I will pull on the sutures again to, to uh, tighten that up. So I'm grabbing the sutures now and I'm pulling on them. You could see the gap close like that. And then I can't get my probe back in there. So it's surprisingly powerful. I was uh, a little bit uh, skeptical when I first saw it, but after doing it now several times, I'm, I'm a big believer in this technique. And so you could see before the, the gap is open and after uh, the capsule pieces, after the knot is closed, uh, tied, the uh, gap is closed. Other options, again, both bone ligament bone or uh, ligament reconstructions. I think worldwide, the, the uh, gold standard remains a modified Brunelli 3LT uh, ligament tenodesis technique described by Mike Arcielias and John Stanley. Uh, but the concern here uh, is with these dorsal ligament reconstructions is uh, this situation where 
It looks pretty good. This is one of my patients I did a 3LT on. It looks pretty good initially. And then after six months, you could see the gap uh, recurs. Now this patient did okay. And again, I think it's because dorsal, we're preventing that dorsal subluxation of the scaphoid. The gap between the scaphoid and lunate, I think is a little less, con uh, less of an issue, um, but it does make for an ugly x-ray. So the question is, is this okay? If we're dorsally reconstructing the ligament, but neglecting the volar side of the ligament and we're having gapping volarly. Uh, the RASL procedure uh, and, and the 3LT, uh, sorry, the SLT procedures are similar, what we call axis procedures, where we're trying to reconstruct the scaphalinian interval via the axis of rotation. So here, this is using a metal screw, uh, but we describe this, this so-called SLAM procedure, or scaphalinian axis method of using a tendon graft instead of a screw passing uh, between the scaphoid and lunate and anchored within the lunate with an anchor into the scaphoid. It's sort of like an ACL of the wrist, if you will. And then the remaining graph would be passed dorsally to reconstruct the all-important dorsal scaphoid ligament. And uh, we presented um, uh, or um, published our results um, with 13 patients with um, uh, mean follow-up of only 11 months, but you could see their gap decreased and the scaphalunian angle also decreased significantly. Um, so to summarize, uh, my algorithm in 2020 for scaphalunian uh, dissociation for pre-dynamic injuries, which are the most common issues, dorsal wrist pain, et cetera, I like to mobilize, modify my activity, inject with steroids, and then if that fails, arthroscopic surgery with thermal shrinkage plus or minus pinning, I think it's very effective. Acute dissociations that are less than eight weeks old, I think uh, an open repair is uh, performed or you can perform the arthroscopic technique I presented or even the metula and capsulodesis technique in, in, in acute injuries. But I think a lot of, most people would probably favor an open repair in that situation. And then in the chronic uh, uh, we, with, with arthritis, it's pretty clear. Uh, we know that we have denervation procedures, arthroscopic debridement, radial sialidectomy. Uh, and then SLAC 2, you're looking at a PRC, and SLAC 3, uh, you're looking at a scaphoid excision for corner infusion. And then the, the, the uh, remaining issue that becomes uh, debated quite, quite frequently is the subacute, where uh, the ligament's no longer repairable, usually after eight weeks of injury, after injury, but there's no arthritis. And that's where there's a number of different techniques, as I, 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 um, I showed you. Uh, I do favor the metul and capsule adhesis in that tech in that situation, or if it's particularly bad, I, I do like the SLAM procedure. Obviously, I'm biased, uh, or the modified Brunelli 3LT procedure, uh, or there may be a new technique uh, down the road that becomes more uh, more reliable. So, with that, uh, I know I'm about 30 minutes. I'd like to thank you, Abrogado, for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions either before the, the cases or after the cases. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Hamis, uh, do you have any uh, questions in the, in the chat? No questions, questions at this no questions. moment, but we started to discuss these cases first. I, I was like, uh, may, may I have a question for Jeffrey? Jeffrey, uh, yes. you talk about the, you, you talk about the, the type three, the, the the acute dislocation that you prefer to use your open repair. Um, the question is, when you do, we here in Brazil, uh, like there was some group in Italians, we used to, we began to use a double double view, a dorsal and a volar view, to to make the volar repair of the ligament, and it seems to be more time, you know. We don't see when you took the, out the Kishner wise, you don't have the opening, and that seems to be very nice. So, but double view is a little bit freaky now. Eh? And then we began to put the anchor, a dorsal anchor, and an anchor in the middle and the more membranous portion of the ligament, and it works. It works. We put two anchors you know, open repair and so on, and put two anchors on a dorsal aspect and in the middle aspect, because it's too difficult to reach an avolar side by dorsal side. And then um, it's a very good way to, 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 to perform. It doesn't open. It maintains uh, clear. Yeah. So that's a, one, that's a one approach, a dorsal approach, two anchors? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so um, that's typically what I would do as well uh, with my uh, with my repairs. Is I would put two anchors, uh, depending how how large the tear is. But yeah, assuming it's completely ruptured, I do do two tear uh, two anchors. Um, you can argue that the members portion does not have a huge amount of structural stability, and so repairing that might not provide much extra benefit. But I think these anchors are pretty low profile, and adding an additional one doesn't necessarily hurt anything. Uh, I think the Volar approach is very attractive and, and um, you know, especially with reconstruction, a lot of reconstructive techniques that use this 360 concept yeah, or it, box concept uh, uh, of doing dorsal to Volar kind of reconstruction. PC hose, hose some kind of Yeah, PC yeah. hose technique, exactly. Yeah, and there are other techniques as well uh, where, again, we're trying to reconstruct the entire construct, not just dorsally. We understand that the dorsal scapulonate ligament is the most structurally sound and most important. But if we neglect the volar side, then we could still have some gapping, as I showed in that yeah. crude cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then no, again, the question is, is, especially with those three LT patients, where they're, they're still gapping dorsally, uh, volarly, and they're gapping on x-rays, those patients still do okay. They do well clinically. The range of motion is quite good, at least 70%, strength over 70%. And, and, no, and most importantly, no degradation to a slack wrist. And so... Again, as long as I think you prevent that dorsal subluxation of the scaphoid to uh, abnormally wear on the radius, then that prevents the progression of the arthritis. And that's really what we're trying to uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do here. And that's why the black capsule thesis also worked well also, right? Because the black capsule thesis does nothing about the gap. It just prevents that yeah. scaphoid from flexing, but also prevents it from dorsally, uh, um, dorsally subluxating. So, yeah. so um, but you know, none of this is purely anatomic, of course, but I think we continue to learn about this pathology and learn new, newer ways and better ways to treat it. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, maybe I missed something about the matulan techniques. What is the indication for? Is just for, uh, not for complete injury, I guess. He, he does it for complete injuries. He does it for complete injuries. I, I my perfect, uh, patient for that partially. is where it's partially torn, but it's it's a high grade partial, so 70, 80, 90 percent, because there's still some connection between the scaphoid and lunate, and that capsule desis is just tightening it, but also performing mm -hmm. that capsule, uh, that the, bringing the capsular tissues down to the ligament to help provide that stability. That's the perfect, in my mind, indication. Now he'll do it for grade four, where it's completely completely disrupted. As long as there's a little bit of ligament on either side and that he can get a, a, get a needle into, he will still do it for that. I, for me, I think it's harder for me to really believe that that would provide as much stability as one of these more larger reconstructions that we talked about briefly. Again, this was in the talk really focusing on reconstruction. I know one of your cases discusses that. Um, you know, but for arthroscopic, he does do it for those patients, but I, I like it for those really bad grade three where it's not shrinkable because it's more than it's more than um, fifty percent partially torn. Let's say uh, less than fifty percent. I think they'll do the shrinkage, and more than that, I'll, I'll do this capsule thesis. And I've been very pleased with that technique. Okay. I have another so, question. So uh, let me share. Uh, we have three cases, and uh, let's start to discuss. And during the discussion, problem, we are going to have more questions about uh, your lecture. Uh, I'm going sure. to share my screen. Hermes, uh, is there any question uh, in the chat? Uh, not, not yet, because I believe that Jeffrey uh, have answered yes. most of the questions that we have now. Just one qu question, how difficult is to suture the uh, ligament uh, attached in, in the lunate with a suture pass, because we know that it's not a gentle instrument. So uh, someone uh, like to know if you have some difficulty to, to have this suture atroscopically. So are you talking about the technique that uh, I showed with the anchor or the uh, Matulin technique? Oh, I'll answer for both. So absolutely for both, I, you know, as you know, sometimes you get in there and that ligament is really small, number one, number two, friable it's, it's you put a suture in it just rips right through 
And in that situation, it's very difficult to do any of these suture repairs. And I think you're looking at a reconstruction. That usually happens several weeks after the injury. If it's an acute injury uh, and you're there within a couple of weeks, one to two weeks or three weeks after the injury, the ligament usually has good strength. And so either of those techniques where you're using a, a suture a, a passer to pass through the ligament, I think is certainly uh, um, uh, um, possible. Uh, now for the, both of those techniques, I always tell the patient beforehand that there's a possibility that while we're doing this, we can't, we, the, the, we can't perform the arthroscopic technique because the ligament quality is not good enough. And then we have to have the patient's permission to move forward with an open uh, technique, open reconstruction. Luckily, I haven't had to do that that frequently. Usually there's a, a decent enough tissue to, to repair. Okay. Okay, okay Jeffrey. Okay. Just the last question now. Um, the last question is what about just the breathing and the refreshing the ligament uh, and just pinning with the scope? What, what's your, your opinion about that? This technique? Yeah. The thermal linkage. Uh, sorry. Hermes, could you repeat? Okay, my, my question or the question of the audience the audience is what about or what is your opinion? about it or just the Bridman refreshing the ligament uh, and pinning with a scope? Ah, so yeah, yeah, so- Closed procedure. Closed completely. I, uh, I think that's a very interesting technique and there's been some working from Korea, uh, from Min Jung Park's group, uh, particularly in the case of a perilunate injury, of uh, just arthroscopically debriding and pinning. Uh, and those patients did, did, did well. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about this situation, about that having enough biology to, to heal and provide enough stability. Um, I agree the quality of the tissue is often not that great um, when, you're, when you're putting suture anchors in there, uh, but there's usually enough to provide some um, attachment of the ligament from the scaphoid to the lunate so that there is some um, biology, some ligament that could potentially heal. I decorticate the bone from which it's been evolved. So there's some blood there, some stem cells that potentially can augment the healing as well. So ultimately, I do think that that makes me feel better um, uh, to think that that would be more biologically sound than just debriding and pinning. Uh, but there is a precedent of, like I said, for the group from Korea that just does that. Now, this is the perilunate situation. So there's both of the ligaments are disrupted both on both sides. So the scaphalunia and the lunatrochoetral ligament. So there's not that opposing force of the intact LT ligament pulling on the lunate away from the scaphoid. So that may be why in the perilunate situation it works better or it works okay. I just don't know. And I, know, I don't know that the work has been done in a primary uh, scaphalunia ligament alone. Um, I'm not aware of any, there could be, um, so it just doesn't provide me with the same amount of confidence that I'm doing the, the best possible thing for the patient. Okay, okay, so let's start the discussion of the case, clinical case. This is the first one, is a chronic scaphalonate, maybe uh, still acute according to your classification, maybe. Uh, so this is a 46 years old, a male, a personal trainer. He fell down uh, over uh, uh, the right hand in a supination seat position, riding a bicycle two months ago. He was attended in an emergency room after the x-ray was oriented to use the wrist splint for two weeks. Had a persistent pain after the beginning of his uh, regular activity as a personal trainer. And uh, the, my initial evaluation was four months uh, after the injury. Uh, he had the pain in the radial side of the wrist. There are clunk signs uh, at when you do, did the uh, Watson maneuver and uh, weakness uh, of uh, grip strength. Here is the x-ray. This is the right side, the D, uh, right side, and the left side. Maybe uh, the x-ray is not so obvious, the lesion. Even the angle, maybe we have some questions. We, we can understand why, uh, we can understand maybe why our colleague in the first attendance uh, didn't uh, realize the, the injury. 
here, uh, but when uh, I ordered uh, MRI, and we can see in the different views, a very uh, complete injury of the scaphalonate ligament in axial view. It's a better view to see this injury. Uh, so this is the X-ray, the intraoperative view. We can see the debris of the ligament. Here we are going to see in the right side the the lunate here, and then we go to the, ra the radial side and see the injury, the mm -hmm. gap. Here is the scaphoid. Pois não. Uh, here is Oi, the scaphoid. Como é que você tá? Tudo bem? Uh, uh, Ramis, uh, uh, here we see the ah, gap sim. in the middle. Sorry, there is a. Uh, here we can see the opening of the opening of the injury, the joysticks showing the instability of the scaphalonate after the fixation. So I'm going to to show the the X-ray with the procedure that we did. Uh, so we we did uh, the anchors. The level of the injury was different. Uh, part was the ligament was in the lunate and part in the scaphoid. That's why we put two anchors. And we did a pin, put a pin to scaffold uh, captate to stabilize the scaphoid. And then we put a screw uh, between the scaphoid and lunate. It's a temporary screw. Maybe we have some uh, questions about, uh, well, concerns about the position of the screw. Maybe later you can talk about that, uh, Jeffrey. So the follow-up, the patient was kept in, in a wrist splint uh, for 70 days, orientation to avoid the use in hand in daily activities. After 70 days, we removed the key wire and also the screw, yeah? and it started the rehabilitation process. This is when we removed the pin and the, the screw. It's an intraoperative view. We had the sensation that was stable, the relation between the uh, scaphoid and, and the lunate. Uh, here is after five months, the follow-up, you still can see that there is no opening between the scaphoid uh, and uh, lunate. And here is uh, after five months, the range of motion. It's the, the right side, the, the problem of the patient, the right one. So good range of motion and is, uh, uh, was back to his job as a personal trainer. Uh, Jeffrey, I have some questions about the, this. Uh, I would like you answer. The first one, uh, how often are your cases of scaphalonate acute or chronic? How often? Usually they come to you as acute case or chronic ones. Uh, so you're talking complete ligament injuries, right, Marcel? Yeah, here? yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I would say probably 80% of our injuries are more than acute. So I usually, I use six weeks as my cutoff, six to eight weeks as my cutoff for acute versus chronic. So probably 80% are, are beyond six to eight weeks. Only 20% are in that six to eight weeks week uh window and the reason i say unfortunately is because if it's within that six to eight week window i think that ligament is much more robust as we talked about and i think it's the uh, ability to acutely repair that is much higher than it when it's beyond eight weeks so that's why i found it interesting that you saw this patient four months after their injury if i understand correctly is that is that right four months uh eight uh two months uh, six, oh, two months six, two months yeah okay Right. So I, I agree. Um, you know, we have this discussion in, in, in the U.S. as well. Some people think that after six weeks, there's nothing left to repair. I, I find that after, I've had good success repairing ligaments up to mm -hmm. 10 weeks. Uh, I always tell patients six weeks just in case, uh, but I've been pleasantly surprised when we go in there 10 weeks later and we could still see there's ligament to repair. So. Um, and now what, anyway. what about the use of a uh, screw like I did? Uh, but I, I like use that. it just for two weeks, two two months, maybe a little bit more. Uh, two months, 
And then I remove. No, I like that technique use, a lot. I used to do it all the time. Um, yeah. I usually use a headed screw. Mm -hmm. I saw you use a headless screw. I usually use a Maybe headed screw so to that remove. I can, right, easier to remove. Uh, but I still, it's still more, it's still difficult to remove because finding that tiny hole with your guide wire <coughs> in the head of the screw is very difficult sometimes. And it's frustrating. So I stopped doing it just for that reason. I think the fixation you get is great. I usually do it for three months. And the beauty of that is I don't use this. I don't use a secondary scapel cap tape pin. So if you just have one screw there, you can start dart throwing motion. You can start regular motion immediately. And then at three months, then go back, remove the screw. And then that they're a little bit ahead of the game in terms of range of motion. So I think that I, I really love that uh, option. I just don't do it anymore as frequently just because it's a, it's a headache trying to take that screw out sometimes. Mm -hmm. I agree totally with you. I agree totally with you. I don't like it. I don't like it mm -hmm. at all. Uh, do, do you think that the ligament repair is enough to guarantee the good results in a long follow-up? Or, or as I'm saying, a good uh, ligament repair is it's just what we need to have a good result. Yeah, so I think this goes back to Alvaro's question, which is a very good question is, do we really think that repairing the ligament alone is really providing the stability that we need here? And, and I do think that if you have good quality ligament, which it appeared that you did in your, your example, I think uh, putting an anchor in there and, and sewing the, the ligament is still the, the standard of care and the best thing to do. But I also, what I'll do is I'll also perform the capsule thesis on top. I'll bring the dorsal capsule down to the ligament, basically the same sutures that I have that I repair the ligament. I don't cut the knot. I don't cut the sutures after I repair the ligament. I leave the sutures so that I can use the same sutures to bring the capsule down to the dorsal mm -hmm. of the scapulonic ligament to yeah. augment and reinforce the repair. And I do think that the combination of the two is what provides me with the, with the robust or the good outcomes that I've seen in my patients. Yeah, you, and the professional activity is a factor to indicate the type of reconstruction or not? Like uh, athletes, athletes or athletes? Yeah, or, so athletes, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm much more aggressive with that, athletes. Uh, I tend to favor repairing even uh, patients that are grade three. Uh, I, I, I like to repair to provide the additional stability. Um, whereas non-professional athletes or even just uh, office workers or people that don't put an extreme amount of load on the wrist, I think you can be a little bit more relaxed uh, and not as aggressive with the, with the treatment um, type. Okay. Hamis, uh, do you have any questions in the chat or not? No, no, no. We can continue no. for the next case. So, so the second case, Dr. Tiago Mata is going to present. So, Tiago. Yes. Uh, hello. Go ahead. Good night to all. My name is Thiago Matar, and I'm going to present you this case. Uh, Próximo. Uh, the case is about a patient with 27 uh, years old uh, who was of male gender. Uh, he presented himself with a pain in the wrist after trauma. He had a progressive worsening of the wrist function six days ago. Uh, because of the clinical presentation, we asked for a, a wrist MRI and a wrist X-ray, and these are the results. On the x-ray, we could identify a uh, presence of a positive teritoma sign or, or a gap of more than three millimeters uh, between the scaphoid and the lunate in the presence of carpal instability with increased uh, scaphoid lunate angle and demonstrating like a uh, gross instability. On the MRI, we could identify a dizzy deformity in the presence of a complete scaphoid lunate ligament uh, injury. So because of these finds and the growth instability, we decided to do an open repair of the scaphoid lunate complete injury. Uh, this is the incision that we made. We, we did a, like a normal incision and uh, opened the third and fourth extensor compartment, opened the capsule and identified the, the lesion of the ligament. Next. Uh, this is a video. So uh, here we can find the intact, the ligament uh, attached to the lunate and rupture on the ischophoid and a very big gap between the two bones. And we were planning the insertion of the anchors in the ischophoid. Next. Uh, so we began by inserting like a, a core screw anchor in the more volar aspect of the ischophoid. Next. 
And then we, we introduce a second uh, corkscrew anchor on a more dorsal aspect of the scaphoid. In that way, we were aiming to repair both the volar portion and the dorsal portion. I know we know that by the dorsal incision, we can access completely the volar portion, but we, we were trying to get the most, most volar possible. And then we do the, using K wires, we made a joystick so we can redux the diastasis between the two bones and then uh, after reduction, we do the suture of the ligament. Next. Uh, this is a video. This is we are introducing the more dorsal anchor of the scaphoid. Next. Uh, what we did different in this case is that after we did the repair of with the two cost to anchor, we also did a technique of internal bracing with a, a swivel lock, DX anchor and fiber tape. We actually use free a swivel lock anchor in the fiber tape, one in the lunate and the other two in the iscaphoid. Uh, next. And uh, we use the corkscrew anchor we use to repair the ligament. We also use it to, like Dr. Jeff uh, was just mentioning, we use to do the capsular disease. We use the same suture of the ligaments to, 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 to repair the capsule. Next. Uh, we also use a uh, one just one K wire to fix the uh, capitate the, with the iscaphoids to, to add uh, more uh, stability. Here we can see a good reduction. And in this video, uh, I'm just, well, I would like to just show the technique of the internal bracing here. Uh, we actually, uh, we can see one of the strips of the fiber tape and the two anchor uh, swivel lock anchor on the lunate and the iscaphoid. After that, we, we create a second strip of the fiber tape and after the introduction of a swivel lock anchor on the distal portion of the iscaphoid, we can add more stability. Next. And after the repair, we checked the stability, and we can see that we have a very good reduction of the iscaphoid and the lunate, and with no gaps, and we, we could uh, test and we were very satisfied with the results. Uh, we know that this is a very uh, new technique. Uh, this was our first case, so uh, I had uh, some questions to Dr. Jeffrey about this case. Uh, my first one is that uh, considering the growth instability, would, uh, would he be able to do a arthroscopic repair in this case? I'm so sorry. I, um, part of the problem of being in the mountains is I lost uh, internet access for a while, so I missed part of the presentation, but I do believe I caught most of it, which was yeah, had an anchor in the dorsal uh, scapulunate, uh, an anchor in the remnants portion, repair that, augmented with the uh, internal brace. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes. We, uh, yeah. we are ma mainly showing this case because of the, of the internal bracing using swivel lock anchors. And uh, I, I was starting to ask you, just uh, first question is that in these ca cases of growth instability, uh, in this particular case, would you do an arthroscopic repair or an open repair? Um, so uh, when there's a evidence of a DZ deformity, I think at that point, it's very difficult, if not a impossible, to do that arthroscopically. Um, and in this case, there appears to be a DZ deformity. So uh, I would prefer, I would have preferred an open approach here. Um, and I would have done the same thing that you did uh, up until the, the internal brace. Now, I don't have anything problem with the internal brace. I think it's a very, very robust reconstruction and very um, um, uh, attractive uh, option. I have two concerns of using the internal brace. Number one, this, uh, this fiber tape is now intra-articular, right? So it will articulate with the dorsal, scapul uh, dorsal portion of the radius. And I wonder if over time that will cause some damage uh, to the articular cartilage of the radio on the radial side. I don't know the answer to that, but that's one concern I have. The you second have concern is that, as you can see, these are 3.5 millimeter swivel lock anchors. And so there's a large drill hole that is placed into both the scaphoid and lunate. And so I worry, and in fact, we're starting to see some patients with radiolucency around the anchors radiographically, as well as some uh, potential concern for avascular necrosis, particularly of the lunate because of the, uh, because of the 
amount of dissection initially dorsally and then you're drilling into the luna in a relatively large anchor and then plus we don't know over time that the forces on that on that uh fiber tape how that will affect the biomechanics of the scapulonate interval so uh i i'm 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 just cautious i i do think it's a very robust it provides immediate robust stability there's no question about that but those are just my two concerns of that technique um, for those reasons. Now, on the other hand, I think it's a very good technique for reconstructing the thumb UCL, the, uh, the MCP on the collateral ligament. That is extra articular, so I don't have any issues with having that reconstruction augmented using the internal brace. Uh, but I have seen, again, some of those lucency around the anchors in the base of the proximal thalamus and and the head of the purple in those situations that provide, give me a little bit of concern. Um, but, um, but I think this is a beautiful result. This patient, I'm sure, will do very well. But I, I just worry. Those are the two things that I worry about. And, and I'd love to see 10 years, 15 years down the road that these patients still are doing great. And in that case, I'll use it every time. That, that was my uh, second and probably third and fourth question. I think you answered most of, of, of them. But... <laughs> Uh, uh, your main concern is about uh, the vascularization of the scaphoid or maybe the like sh chances of uh, bone fracture uh, or the problem is the fiber tape of the, the fiber tape being in an interarticular position. I think probably that the, the fiber tape being interarticular bothers me more. I think there's plenty of precedent of having large drill holes in the scaphoid and lunate and it being okay. Do you have any experience with these fiber tapes uh, in any uh, application or maybe in different parts of the uh, hand surgery? Like not in, not interarticular, uh, and that's why that's why I'm concerned because I don't know, and I don't know that anybody knows how that it it'll it'll be uh, long term, and and I think we'll see five years or ten years down the road whether or not it's a problem or not. I may be overreacting and it may be totally fine and hopefully it is totally fine. And if that's the case, and like I said, I'll use it every time. But until I see that data, uh, I, I, I have enough concern and I think there are another, uh, a number of an, uh, other good options that I currently use um, so that I don't necessarily use it for this. Again, I don't, I don't think you did anything wrong. I just, those are, that's, those are my concerns uh, for, as to why I haven't adopted this technique. Okay, Thiago. Okay, yep. Okay. Uh, oh, Diga, uh, please. Okay. Good Hello, evening, Diga. everyone. Jeffrey, it's a pleasure to, to see you. We've yeah. met uh, last year in Minnesota in a risk course there. That's right. And I asked right. you to organize a course like that in California that is a little bit warm than Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Love to. Uh, <laughs> I'll present a, a case of a young boy, a, a 18 years old boy. He had a previous uh, syndrome, it's Erling Dunlop syndrome, a, a ligament laxity, very serious case with previous ankle surgeries through repetitive, repetitive sprain. A lot of pain into the, uh, to the right wrist and uh, recent a worsening of pain of trauma playing volleyball. Uh, my, my, my screen is closed here. So this is the, the clinics. If you, if you can hear, there's a clock. It's a, uh, you can hear the clock uh, when he moves the wrist. If you, It's not sound, I, I can hear, but if you can hear the, the, the click and the clunk of the wrist and hear and try to move flex and extend it. Ulnar and radial deviation. Okay. Did you notice the, 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 the click and clunk? It's, it's, it's painful and audible and uh, very difficult to, to, to do the active living uh, things and like studying, eating, putting clothes. It's a very disturbing. 
Uh, during the examination, when we stabilize the PZ form in Trichetrum, there is improvement in the click and pen. It was described in many articles. Uh, the, the article that I like the most is a PC whole article that they, they described this technique to stabilize the, the ulnar wrist part to improve the, the click and pen. And it happens with this boy. So, Marcelo, I, I think you can move on. This is the X-ray. I actually didn't see anything most important. Maybe, maybe a little busy situation of the, the this wrist, but I, I, I don't think we can trust in this X-ray. It's very similar. This is the, the control lateral side uh, in the bottom part of the screen, but it's very normal to me. And uh, in the next, the MRI, no apparent ligament injury, a little bit of synovitis. And I, I don't know if Jeffrey agrees with me, the dorsal ligament, no, come on. Uh, the dorsal ligament is a little bit step off from bones. I, I don't think there are capsular redundance and it's difficult to see, but maybe. And when he, you see lunate, maybe there is a irregularity of the lunate in the bottom part, bottom part of the lunate. But I don't think it's, you can trust, but it, it's a pretty normal MRI. And I don't, maybe Jeffrey can see. Okay, uh, now what? Uh, there are a lot of situations regarding mid-carpal instability, uh, especially in a very young boy with Erling Donald syndrome. I'd like to hear from Jeffrey, what would be your treatment options for this case, please? Okay, uh, okay. thank you for that case. Um, perhaps we can go back to the um, MRI. Perfect, thank you. So um, it sounds like a classic example of mid-carpal instability. Um, I like the technique you showed, which is the, to stabilize the pisiform and pushing up on the pisiform that helps stabilize the piezotriquetral joint and helps stabilize the proximal row. Um, another technique that I like to do clinically is the mid-carpal shift test, which is to basically load the uh, wrist when the patient's making a fist and go from radial to ulnar deviation. And when the, the patient's going from ulnar, uh, radial to ulnar deviation, as the handmate um, articulates with the triquetrum, that helicoid articulation of the ham, uh, triquetral handmate joint will cause the proximal to flip uh, and reduce. And so I like to do that to help confirm the diagnosis. And lastly, what I'll typically do is a a cine radiography. So under live fluoroscopy, do the same mid-carpal shift test and, or mid-carpal clunk, clunk test and under live x-ray fluoroscopy, visualize that. And that helps me confirm that, again, we're not dealing with uh, our carpal instability, not a dissociative pattern, and that this is a carpal instability, non-dissociative pattern or a SIND uh, mid-carpal instability. And if, and if that all bears out and it looks like on your examination that's true, then the treatment is, is very challenging, as I, I'm sure you're, you all know, and that's why this case is being presented. Um, a couple of factors. Number one, mid-carpal instability in general is difficult to treat. But add on top of that that this patient is Erlos Danlos, and that, could, that, makes, um, that makes it sort of even more difficult. Um, the other thing I would do prior to talking about treatment is also check the other side. Because he is Erlos Danlos, he may have ligamentous laxity on his contralateral side, uh, the asymptomatic side. And they have, he, has, uh, he has, but less significant than the right side. It's okay. no, no pain, but it, it, it is a clink and a clunk, but no pain. In the, the, it didn't affect the daily living activities. Great, great. So obviously for this, I would spend a lot of time to make sure I exhaust all non-surgical measures. I would immobilize the patient, cast the patient four to six weeks. I would do therapy. I would try steroid injections. I would do whatever I could to avoid surgery because the typical treatments that I do for a non-Erlos-Danlos patient with mid-carpal instability 
which works quite well, is arthroscopic going in there again with thermal shrinkage. And I, I briefly showed the radioscopic capitate ligament viewed on arthroscopy from the midcarpal joint. And if you look to the other side of the capitate, you'll see the almost capitate ligament coming from the other side. So they'll form, they'll come from both sides and, and basically attach at this capitate at the same location. And that's called the arcuate ligament. When the radioscopic capitate and the ulnar capitate ligament um, um, coalesce. And a great treatment for a non aerolos danlos patient would be to do thermal shrinkage of that ligament to stabilize the midcarpal joint. And I've done that in many non aerolos danlos patients, and they've done very well. Obviously, with aerolos danlos, any procedure involving collagen is not going to work. It's going to stretch out again, and so that wouldn't be possible. Same with any soft tissue procedures, any soft tissue uh, tenodesis procedures, things like that. I think it would be difficult to be confident that it would work in an aerolist analyst patient. So if this patient truly failed all non-surgical measures, uh, and I would try maybe a denervation procedure as well, uh, AAN, PIN, norectomy, and if that all failed, then in my hands, I would probably favor doing a, a partial wrist fusion, a midcarpal fusion. So uh, this patient, we spend a lot of time doing therapy, doing uh, ortheses, splintings, and, uh, and even Botox, even toxin botulin, we use them. But no progress, no, the, the pain remains, and we have to move on and think about surgery with all concerns that you, 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 you talk about, about one first. Marcelo, pode voltar um pouquinho? Marcelo, volta, por favor. Uh, there are many papers about uh, midcarpal instability. The, these are ones that I, I base my, my decision-making process. The PC Hope paper about, you know, disease, uh, dorsal application of midcarpal instability. And I like it too much of this paper from Corella about uh, volar central portal wristotroscopy and to close the interval between the, the four bone that from a uh, capitator, amator, donate, and trichotron. And you close this, this, this space with the arcade ligament and also makes this more is, is stable. In this case, I discussed with Toshi Nakamura and PC Hall there in Minneapolis. And uh, each one has his own decision to, to it's, it's not a simple situation. But Toshi Nakamura told me to do a dorsal application because of the, he told me about this, uh, this, this capsule laxity, the dorsal capsule laxity that is very common in Allen Delano syndrome. And I keep that in mind to, to do in this case. So I did a arthroscopy, considering this is a young boy to do a bone fusion. So this is the, the 6R portal with a lot of synovitis and you see the, the space, a normal, very, not usual space to see. So I operating the the, the ligament, interosseal scaphalonic ligament, but a lot of, a lot, it's a dry arthroscopy with a lot of synovitis. I try to, to, to clean the, the, the joint, bleeding a lot. So I pour water and saline when it starts to bleeding. It's, uh, it's, it's very usual when you, you do that. Marcelo is going to put the, the, the arthroscopy in the midcarpal joint. I have no control of this movie, sorry, people. This is the sedation. Marcelo, pode um pouco mais para frente. No, no instability from this point. Now we are in the midcarpal. You see, it's a type two lunate, and the volar ligaments, the arcade ligament, the midcarpal, and uh, capitate and lunate. I'll, I'll put, I'll, I'll do a Corella, uh, 
incision in volar part of the wrist to make this volar central portal. And through this volar central portal, uh, we see some Geisner instability in the, the in both, both bones, maybe type three. I don't know if you agrees, but I, I think in type three, two or three. This is the volar ligament, so palpating the, the ulnar part of the arcade ligament. And from and through this volar portal, I'll do the same. I, I cannot say this is a capsule disease, but I, I try to close this space to give more stability in the volar part of the wrist. I'll show there is a, a, a fragment, a cartlet fragment that I take it off. Marcelo, can you go? Okay. This is the volar midi, 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 midi portal, uh, volar portal. This is my probe from this volar portal. It's easily, it's, it's, it's easy to visible. It's a, a very common technique of a, 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 a loop made with nylon suture. And with a single suture, you can just close this space. I'm passing through the ligament. It's, it's, it's easy to understand, Jeff, for you. I don't know if you, okay. I'm closing that space. So the first part of surgery was to close that space. Of course, we have traction. And when you have traction, we, we don't see too very much this closing uh, uh, situation. But when you lose the, the traction, okay. I'm back again to the radial, the 6R portal. This is a, a anchor suture in, in lunate. And with this anchor suture, uh, through the mini mini incision, I do the plicature of the, the, of the dorsal capsule. It's like a matulang technique with this, this suture, but I, I do this plication of the dorsal, dorsal capsule. So I, I make this wrist stronger or um, not able to move to uh, as the, uh, the, the motion we have after. So this is the 2K wires to stabilize the, the, the surgery. I kept these key wires for six weeks. So I, I took it off. It's after six months of surgery with a very good improvement of the clunk and clink and the, the pain. We start to start again, to write, to, to eat. It's a very good result. I don't know to, Till when? Because it's Erlen Delon syndrome, we don't know how it lasts. But we can postpone a fusion. Maybe it's a good option for a young boy. It's in my opinion and why I chose this technique for this case. I'd like to hear your opinion, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that case. I, th I think that's a great case. Uh, I, uh, a great result. Um, as I said earlier, um, I'm always concerned with a patient with Erlos Danlos with any soft tissue procedure because I worry that over time it will stretch out. Um, but that's a great result and I hope that it, that, that result is, is um, persistent, that it continues to uh, be good for the patient. Um, sometimes I think, yeah, fingers crossed, I, sometimes I think that uh, along with what Avaro said earlier is that just tightening everything provides the stability and it, it takes away that clunk uh, and that's, that takes away the symptomatology and, and hopefully that's, that's been done. And like you said, there's no bridges that are burned because if it fails, if it stretches out over time, you become symptomatic two years, five years, 10 years down the road, then you could always go to do a different procedure like a salvage or, or something else. So, so I think that's great. Thanks that's for great. sharing. So, so you basically imbricated both volar capsule and then dorsal capsule, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the idea, volar and dorsal. Yeah, that's really nice. Thank so, uh, uh, I know we are too late. Yeah, Jeffrey, I, I promised that okay. we would stop uh, on eight o'clock, but sorry. 
No so problem. I'm happy. Uh, Remy, is, is there any other question in the chat? Just the last one, maybe. No, no, no. We don't have any no. questions. Okay. Uh, I believe that everything was answered. Okay. Thank you. So, so Jeffrey, again, sorry to disturb you, you and your family, but no uh, was excellent. The discussion, your uh, your lecture, was perfect. Okay. Okay. And I hope to see you soon. Yes, you, that's Jeffrey. my only regret is that we can't do this in person, so I can't yeah. see you all in person. It's it's my pleasure uh, to spend this hour with you. I had I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot, um, and and I hopefully contribute as well. And and I hope you all stay safe. You know, I we were talking about how the cases in Brazil are uh, are concerning, just like in the United States. So I hope um, good health to everyone. Okay. You too. You too. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye, Jeffrey. Have a good okay. time. Bye bye. Thank Hope you. To see you all soon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Was was good, yeah. Foi muito bom. É, é, é que eu prometi para ele que ia terminar às oito. Nós passamos da. Ele está com a família lá, por isso que não deu para. Mas acho que foi legal, né? Eu acho que foi legal. deu para. Depois, Edgar, você explica para todo mundo a técnica, tá bom? Só você que não entendeu. Explica de novo. Tchau. Tchau. Você Tchau. faz um esqueminha para a gente, vai, Edgar. Ok. Tá bom, pessoal. Tchau. Tchau, Tchau pessoal. Boa noite. Valeu, valeu. Boa noite. Tchau.